Uli. Hi, Lila. <laughs> My guest today is Ulrich Gerhardt, uh, who is the head technician and the concert um, technician for Steinway in London. And I would also add, probably, you're the chief uh, psychiatrist at Steinway, <laughs> um, because Uli has worked with and continues to work with the great pianists who we enjoy today. Uli was with us in Hamburg. He guided the whole um, choosing of the Steinway as Scott Harker, our Vancouver wonderful piano technician, came over with us, and uh, Paul Lewis. So between Uli and Scott and Paul, we knew we'd got a winner. And Uli has, by the way, since really been a part of the life of the VRS because he comes over more or less once a year to give our piano a complete physical workout. Um, but we missed him this year, of course, uh, unfortunately, but hopefully you'll be back. Currently, he is in Liverpool, and I need to find out what he's doing in Liverpool. Uh, Liverpool, I'm in Liverpool now because Liverpool Philharmonic Hall, which is a glorious hall just across the road from the hotel here, an Art Deco building, stunning hall, um, with the Liverpool Philharmonic Orchestra, which over the last two decades really has been very, very successful, very much like the Birmingham Symphony Orchestra under Simon Rattle. Right. The Liverpool Philharmonic has become a real cultural asset for Liverpool as a city and the people of Liverpool. And they now start doing three concerts a day, uh, three concerts a week, um, with two concerts in a day with a very reduced audience. But they are also starting to perform again. So all the pianos that have been dormant really since March need a bit of TLC to be woken up again. And um, that's what I'm up to when I don't do concerts. The first real beginning of live performance, speak without audience, was in June when Whitmore opened its doors for performers, uh, mostly a, a duo, i.e. solo instrument and piano accompaniment or leader. Uh, and solo recitals, and a lot of the VAS artists like um, Paul Lewis and Stephen Hoff and Imogen Cooper uh, and Mitsuko uh, were all there performing. So it was, for me, uh, a great month to actually have the time to be in London for a month to look after every single concert at Whitmore Hall. What usually happens is I maintain the pianos at Whitmore, I might do a concert with Andras, for example, and then I come to Vancouver or I go to Atlanta or I go to Melbourne or I go to any of the UK venues. And a fortnight later, I go back to Wigmore Hall to do maintenance on that piano and see it after many other of my colleagues have tuned the piano. And the other interesting thing was that because of the pandemic, there was only one piano on stage and everybody had to play the piano. And, you know, naming just a few names, Angela Hewitt would have played a different made piano. Mitsuko would have brought her own. Stephen Hoff might have brought a different piano. Um, Paul Lewis might have wanted to play the old Wigmore piano. But this time it had to be one piano and that piano had to be right for everybody. And as it happened, it really, really worked very well, including the, the two final days where Angela Hewitt was playing a Bach recital. Uh, and on the last day of the season, Mitsuko was doing um, Winterreise with Mark Petmore, same oh, piano. Yes, yes, so yeah. So it it, <clears throat> um, it shows very much what my job is to have a piano in a venue that actually, if it's well looked after, can really be an exceptionally good piano for any pianist. That's so fascinating. Now, the, out of that come a lot of questions, Uli. Um, <clears throat> and the first question is, how many pianos does Wigmore Hall itself own? Wigmore Hall owns three pianos. Two that were selected in 2007 by Andres and I in Hamburg, of which one is in storage and one has been sold. And um, the sold one was replaced in 2015 with the now new piano, 
which Igor Levitt and I selected in Hamburg in December 14. So that has been the main piano since January 2015. It had a new set of hammers and shanks in summer last year, which have very much transformed the piano. It's the piano that does probably 90% of all the concerts. And then the second piano that Wickmore own is the Old Lady, which is a 1980 piano selected by, um, by Jeffrey Parsons. Mm -hmm. And that piano has been rebuilt umpty times um, and recently had a new pin block and will now remain in the hall for at least another decade. The third piano is the second piano of the pair selected in 2007, and that is currently in storage and has been used occasionally for Wigmore events that didn't happen at Wigmore but somewhere else. Right. And ultimately, I think that piano will be sold in order to replace the 2015 piano. That's probably within the next four years. Um, so that Wigmore Hall will remain with a fairly new piano that does seven concerts a week. So the wear and tear is yes, quite dramatic. Yes. I mean, that yes. piano, age four, had a new set of hammers and shanks and was restrung. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, that's probably as tough going as it goes for performance pianos. Yes, um, yes. And um, the the difficulty with Wigmore is that the pianos are st stored under the stage, and in order to get the pianos out, you have to take the stage panels off, bring the piano up with a lift, put the legs and pedals back on, so you can't do, for example, a piano tryout and then select your piano. The decision who plays what is very much done by house management in me, and there's only very few artists that have sort of the reputation at Wigmore that they can demand to have a certain piano. I guess, as I say, when people buy their tickets and come to concerts, uh, they have no idea of all the shenanigans that have to go on uh, around getting the piano in perfect pitch on stage and uh, all the things that have to happen, all the steps that have to be taken. There was a wonderful um, email I had from Andras once before he came to Vancouver asking whether I would be there. And his term, of course, we speak German with each other. His term say, will you be in Vancouver? And I'll say the German word now. To, to, wirst du in Vancouver sein, um den Flügel wach zu küssen? And that means, will you be in Vancouver to kiss the piano alive again before <laughs> I come? And that's really what it is. But it's also very much the preparation for a piano. Um, I compare it sometimes like athletes gearing up for a race. And then yes. you have concerts with really particular pianists, like Mitsuko, for example. It's yeah. not just, well, you have a piano there, you tune it up, it's done. It's very often discussions over weeks to decide which piano and how to prepare it. The classic was this year at the BBC Proms. The, what the, one of the first live proms at the Albert Hall during this season to an empty Albert Hall was Mitsuko Chida playing with the LSO and Simon Rattle. And she started with the piano sitting even on an extra platform out of the stage because Simon wanted to get as many players on stage as possible. She started with the first movement of the Moonlight solo piano at the Albert Hall. That went over into Kurtak's piece, Quasi Una Fantasia, for piano, percussion, and orchestra. And wow. then a commissioned piece with Thomas Ardes. And to have a piano that can deliver the, the first movement of a Moonlight and then being used as an orchestral piano as yeah. well in a modern oh. piece is you need to have the absolute right choice of piano. You also need to know exactly what the pianist wants from the piano. And it is then a real team effort to make it happen. That's what I love about the job, because it's all about the right piano for the right player and all the time necessary that you have to battle for to make the piano perform at its best. And what we have at Wigmore now, we have a lunchtime concert at, at one. Before the lunchtime concert, the hall is cleared and fumigated. And then there's a rehearsal, then there's a tuning, then there's the broadcast, then the hall is cleared, fumigated, if the piano needs to sit in the room to be decontaminated, and then there's another rehearsal in the concert. So 
de facto for the piano tuner there's probably only 20 minutes time before each concert to actually get the piano ready Good which is God. why yesterday after Igor's concert I went in because last night's concert was cancelled to have two hours of peace and quiet with the piano before the weekend where again we have two concerts every day Saturday Sunday Monday so it's you have to keep your eye on the ball all the time. It's also the reason people ask very often, why do pianos and concert venues, why can't they be old? And the answer is very simple, because they get worked so hard and there's so little time for maintenance. If you have to rebuild a piano before every concert, it <laughs> wouldn't happen because there is not the time. Yeah. And with John Gilhooly, that piano, the number one piano, which is doing so well now, that will retire before it is 10. And it has to, not because it's a bad piano, but because it has done such terrific work that the time comes for it to go to sort of a quieter life somewhere else. So in a way, uh, it's sort of like a racehorse. It is. It is. And my, my, my own pianos, I've got 11 concert grants in my own fleet, which are the ones that go to the proms and to a lot of recordings and to music festivals. They start their life when I pick them out and then I let them develop their character. So I, I select them for a character, but like a child is born with a character as a parent, yeah. you, you help the child develop that character. And if it wants to go off the rails, you put it back on the rails. That's exactly <laughs> what you do with a piano. Yeah. And then you, then you also over the first sort of 12 months introduce the piano to some pianists so they can try it that also gives you feedback of artists, what they really think about the piano. And then you tweak it a little bit. And by year one, one and a half, the piano is fully formed and probably peaks when it's three years old. And then one tries to maintain it at that level for as long as possible. And uh, usually after seven, eight years in, in my own fleet, they retire. Age is very much part of the character, part of why you use one piano for one thing and not for another thing. And um, again, it's important that you have the continuity in your relation, in my position, with the instruments, rather than seeing them once, you're so marvelous, do your job and then forget about them. Yeah, That's what I also say to people that select pianos there's usually a huge fundraising a lot of people get, get excited about the piano then there's the piano selection and then the poor piano lands in the venue and is forgotten about and deteriorates and that has been the beauty with the VAS piano because it landed in Vancouver and it was looked after from a moment it set foot into the city and this I think 2020 is one of two years I haven't been to see the piano and it, it's so interesting to me because Actually, Oli, this is one of the challenges, I think, of the industry in which you work. Um, and that is, and I don't know, uh, I guess Europe is probably the best off because uh, there's probably no shortage of fine technicians in Europe. But there sure seems to be a shortage of really fine technicians in Canada and what that leads me to think about is it would be so nice if there were training facilities for people to learn how to work on pianos. Now I think there used to be one in Ontario at L in London didn't there? That's right and and because of Elaine Adair, who's an alumna yes. of the Western, yes. she sponsored a masterclass over two days. And the first day was doing a, a lecture, almost like the lecture recital together with the pianist, uh, John Perry, to yes. explain the dynamics between piano technician, pianist and piano. And then the second day was an all-day class on how to prepare piano. And that was for piano teachers as well as students as well as established piano technicians. Now, that school shut down from one year to the next, although they just refurbished the building, mainly because of bureaucracy and politics of the whole dilemma of the academics of becoming a piano technician. And I think what happened is that the people that were teaching 
didn't have the right credentials and therefore didn't get the job. And so the person running it, who was a piano person, said, well, if that's your attitude, then I'm not doing this course. And that was the end of the course. The dilemma of doing piano tuning to the highest level, you need to have, like I have, I work 95% on concert grants, okay? Now we only make 250 concert grants a year. Now you don't have to be a brainchild to realize that in order to be exposed to concert grants all the time to get the skills to deal with somebody like Mitsuko, there is not the opportunity. Nor can a lot of pianists demand a piano technician to be there all day with them when they play a concert because the promoter says, sorry, we can't pay for this. Okay. And Brendel was a good example. When Brendel negotiated the concert, it always included a piano and a piano technician. That was part of the deal. And Brendel could have not played otherwise. And I saw him recently. He, for him, we, me and a handful of colleagues were his piano angels. We, we were, and we are still like family to him because it goes way beyond preparing a piano. I, for, for my own, what I can give to the industry is work with piano technicians in venues like Scott that don't look after so many concert grants like that to share with them how I read a piano and what I do to it and what I don't do to it. I share my experience with the company, with pianos I work on, with everybody that is within my field of where I'm responsible for pianos. And as a result, people like Scott become close friends and I have them scattered around the world and I see them very much as part of what my team is that helps making piano performance as best, as best as possible. I must say, though, um, <clears throat> in the beginning of the lockdown, I, I heard and watched on my computer more pianos that were out of tune than I've ever heard in my entire life. And even from pianists of note. I know, but, but I said that before when we started talking, that one thing that has become very obvious is that in all the home broadcasts, that the quality yeah. of pianos, and that yeah. plays back into why are there not more piano technicians around? If, if every pianist in their city had an active relationship with the piano tuner tuning their home piano, we would have a completely different underlying structure of how pianists look and see a piano. I now do a lot of lectures to young pianists, and I say to young pianists, if you get a concert engagement, do ask what piano you have. Yeah? Don't just go and then there's a crappy piano and there's nothing you can do about it. Ask whether it has been tuned. And if it hasn't been tuned, you know, and there's no budget for it, well, it might be an idea to actually ask your piano tuner to tune and maybe pay for it yourself because it is your instrument for the day, you know? And I also said to them, and that doesn't happen very often, if you play a really, really good piano, go to the people that own the piano and the person that tuned the piano and make sure they know that you really appreciate that you played a good piano. Because one reason why the piano is a good piano is because they bought a good piano in the first place, but also that they maintain it it, and that doesn't come for free. So that when this person goes on stage, he has a good piano and they need to acknowledge it. And I said, in colleges, you have all these clapped out pianos that you play every day Find the piano tuner, try to learn why a piano is good, bad, or indifferent, so that when you come on stage and the piano is no good, you can actually make a judgment why it is no good. There's a real threat through pianists I meet in piano competition that people that came to me actively in piano competitions are very often then winners or prize winners, and they are then people I would have a long-term relationship with, like Paul Lewis, you know? Yeah. I met him first yeah, yeah. at the World Piano Competition. Um, and at the Leeds Piano Competition in 2018, when Eric, Eric Liu won, um, and also, if it happens or not, but it's planned to happen, 2021 Leeds again, when the pianists do their piano tryout, they get forced to spend some time with me, okay? Ah. To ask questions about the piano. Oh, well, we, did um, that, yeah. we, we did that in 2018. And half of them were completely confused because they had nothing to say to me. And that sums it up 
pianists play the piano, but they're actually not interested in the piano, nor the people that tune pianos. And that's another reason why the industry is in such a dilemma. You know, that's, but that's bizarre. It is. It's almost. I would, even, some I would imagine it's the mo- should be the very most important thing to pianists. Yeah. One would think so. Good maybe, God. maybe to be fair, they are shy and don't know what to say. But they probably don't know what to say because in uh, in, their, in their course as becoming a pianist, they don't. There's nothing on the curriculum that teaches them about the piano. So yeah. all their knowledge comes from pressing keys down and see what comes out. And if a key doesn't work right, then you just make it up somehow. Good God. You know, just by the way, to go back to Alfred Brendel, um, I remember the first <clears throat> first time I brought him to Vancouver. And actually, I can't remember what year that was. Uh, it's on our website. But anyway, the contract <clears throat> said that if he would, the contract said he would come two days before, and if he didn't like the piano, he would have the, the they would have the right to fly a technician into Vancouver from New York, and that would nice. be covered by the Vancouver Recital Society. And I can tell you, so that's I think we still had our old piano then, our firstborn, which was a pretty yeah. terrific piano. Yeah, no, I, I know it. The plan was to take him straight from the airport, and he arrived at, you know, three in the afternoon, to the Chan Center <clears throat> to try the piano. And uh, so on the way to the university, I had also heard that he's a real wine buff. He knows his wines in and out, inside out. So I said to him, Mr. Brendel, because, you know, there was that night he had to eat. And I said, Mr. Brendel, do you have any friends in Vancouver? You have plans for this evening. And he said, no, I don't. I said, oh, does that mean I'm stuck with you? (laughs) (laughs) And he said, I'm afraid so, my dear. So I said, okay, I'll take you to a wonderful restaurant for dinner. And uh, I know that you like wonderful wine, but remember, we're a non-profit organization. Um, So, you know, we got off. Anyway, fortunately, he liked the piano. We didn't have to bring the technician. And I actually took Alfred Brendel on an ugly house tour of Vancouver. Oh, he would have loved that. (laughs) Yeah. So, um, anyway, thank God the piano past his uh, master so yeah do you also tune the pianos at king's place yes i, I was there this week as well they, they've started again and imogen cooper will be there next week they have two very nice concert grants um that are fairly new one went in end of last year and the other one went in the year before so they are now past 10 years so they had a 10-year lease so both pianos, the first lease is up, so they've been replaced with new pianos. So they're in a very good, in a very good place. Um, the venue is run because the venue itself hasn't got an artistic director. The programming has been a bit funny. And uh, before the new pianos went in, it all went a bit belly up. But... They, they, I think they've turned a corner. Certainly with piano maintenance, we are back where we need to be. And um, we'll have to see how everybody survives this pandemic as well. One venue that I think has been amazing um, in, in their forward planning uh, has been Wickmore Hall, which is a venue built in 1901. And they've, every summer they shoved some more technology into the hall so that before the pandemic happened, they were kitted out with staff to do all the online broadcasting with video and audio. Remarkable. I mean, the the um, the June special broadcast season was literally all the online broadcasting and filming and editing of that was done by two people in house. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm still amazed that that 
Wigmore can put on as much as they do. Here in the UK, it's all we are all preparing ourselves for a second wave in the winter and it's already starting yeah. as does in, in Europe. I spoke with my parents. There's more happening in Berlin as well. Yeah. It's unavoidable. Yeah. Um, and whereas the governments, of course, try to prop up industry and secure jobs and make sure people that can't work get paid. How the arts are coming out of this, I really have no idea. Well, in um, the individual musicians, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's it's frightening. Now, how did you get to where you are? Did you fly or did you drive? I, I drove. I've I've been, I've been avoiding all public transport. Yes, I've been on one plane to Hamburg and back. Um, I in London, I drive in and then have a folding bike in the boot so that I can move around in central London, avoiding the yeah. congestion charge. Yeah, because we. we We've got I had all my tuners furloughed, and the first two came out of furlough in, I think it was in April, yeah, end of April, beginning of June, and now I've got still three part-time furloughed. The rest are working, but initially when we started domestic tunings, we said to the clients that our team will not use public transport. Now we had expense expenses. From one of our tuners for months, seven hundred pounds just to get around in London for parking, congestion, charge, everything. Which means we tune private pianos, but we don't make any profit with it. I also, with my team, because I don't want to lose on any of our tuners, we paid them all full whack. We even up the government pay so that they earned probably more than they would have earned if they made money. But that can't continue forever. And I've got two very talented young tuners that I want to get now into the system because they are the ones that long-term will work. Um, one of them is an Italian girl, C- Serena, yeah. who's absolutely yeah. terrific. Great. She did, her first, she did her first Wickmore tuning on Tuesday. Ah. I tuned the piano the day before to make sure, but uh, she did it and that won't be the last time. One has to be positive. I mean, what is so hard is not knowing when I can come back to Vancouver, what to do with South America, what to do with America, um, because at the moment it's all a no-go area, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, listen, it's been it's been so fantastic uh, to catch up with you. And, you know, we talked about uh, the family here and Elena Dare and John, um, and I didn't even mention the one person, the person who is responsible for are owning this piano and that's Martha Lou Henley. Yeah. Um, uh, you must you must say no to them all. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uli, I hope now you know I have two prayers. One is that we will get these Goldberg variations. Yes. Oh yeah. And and you'll come along for the ride. Oh Andres and Andres was so disappointed not to come, as was I. And there was something I was looking forward to so much. But that's life, and life goes on, and we'll make it happen. We will. If nothing else, we'll make it happen. Yes. Take care. Bye, Lila. Take care. Bye-bye. Be well. Bye.